You're listening to Sacks in the Basement, a production of the Broadcast Basement Limited, where every show is 30 minutes of good and comes from a basement bar on the south side of Chicago. Pull up a stool, pour a cold one, and join us right now for Sacks in the Basement. Heard everywhere podcasts can be found and always at SacksInTheBasement.com. Hey, what's up, guys? My name is Jordan. I'm from uh, Los Angeles, diehard Sox fan. Uh, just quick thought. Just wanted to pick your guys' brain. The, the attitude towards the front office from White Sox fans seems to be damned if you do, damned if you don't. Um, Sox Twitter bitches all day about no movement, but any attachment to a free agent causes an uproar. Rather, the bum garners too worn out. Uh, Ryu's got a bad elbow. Castellanos has poor defense, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I feel like if uh, we sign nine Mike Trout, someone com- would complain there's no lefty bats. So uh, just want to ask you guys, what's the perfect move or moves, if any? And is it just bitterness for lack of landing a major free agent that's causing uh, you know all this negativity? Uh, just want to you know, hear your guys' thoughts. All right, guys, peace. That is a good call to kick off the show. Remember, you can call anytime, 24-7, 365. You just call the number, leave a message. 708-459-8406, 708-459-8406 to talk to Sox in the basement. There is no perfect move. There's never going to be a move that's going to make everybody happy. I completely get that point. And I think White Sox fans have started to get confused by debate over which player they'd like to have in a vacuum and actually rooting for a move to be made. A perfect example is, let's talk starting pitching. The top two starting pitchers were Cole and Strasburg. Most reasonable people didn't believe the White Sox were going to be in on that or spend the money or give the years for either one of those players. After that, in any particular order, and there were arguments from all sides on White Sox Twitter and at your local bar, was Wheeler, Bumgarner, Ryu, Keiko. And there's been arguments for all four of them. The problem is every time somebody gets linked to the White Sox, our caller's exactly right. People start to get angry it isn't the guy they want. But we're not going shopping. Like, you're not walking into a market and there's 12 Keikles up there and there's plenty for everybody. There's only so many of these guys and finding the perfect guy in free agency is almost an impossibility. That's why missing out on Wheeler hurt so much because that was the guy that obviously the team had identified and they won and they thought fit perfectly. But I think what fans really should be looking at is if I can get one of those four, one of the Bumgarner, Keikles, Ryu's, Wheelers, and two of them are off the board already. And I think that's what's now making everybody so nervous. So I, I get that part of it. Same thing when you talk about like right fielders. There's pluses and minuses for every player. I think it's fun to debate that, and I think debate's a healthy thing, but I also get the angst and the anger if they get nothing. You know, you could list four or five different guys you could put out in right field. If you get nothing out of that, be angry. If if you get something out of there, then you should be happy. It might not be the guy that you wanted, but you don't have everybody available to you. Some guys might not even be an option because some guys want to play in a certain place. Some guys want to play in a certain league. Some guys are evaluated by our scouts differently from how you're evaluating them with baseballreference.com and your laptop. So debate is great. I, I don't get the anger whenever they're attached to something. I'm totally with the caller on that one. Finally, Sox have put themselves in a terrible position. They have been cheap and made poor personnel moves so much ever since 05 in the World Series. And then even before that, in the 90s, there were questionable moves by the front offices with Jerry Reinsdorf still as the owner that I think White Sox fans are in a prove-it mode. We've talked about this. They need proof. And I think some of the negativity comes from that. You're right, though. If good things happen, like like we, we lauded the Grandal deal, Not everybody thought it was the best guy to go get, but it was a move, and it showed being proactive. If they would have gotten Wheeler, even though he wasn't my number one pick at pitcher, I'd have been pumped up if they went and got one of those top-end starting pitchers, and they still have a chance to go and do that, although time is running out. Sox fans have to be happy if they're doing something to improve their team to get closer to a championship. Then again, we get to Sox Fest, and their only moves are pretty much what they've done so far and a couple of low-end starting pitchers. Pitchfork's out. I'm totally cool with the yelling at that point. Dave's off today, so I want to do one more call before I jump into the meat of the show. 708-459-8406-365-247. 
call at any time, leave a message. Here we go. What's up, Socks in the Basement? Uh, I was just spitballing a bit. Uh, what's your thoughts on uh, Caleb Smith uh, on the Marlins, the lefty pitcher? He's about uh, 28 or 27 years old. It seems like a guy the Sox could trade for and uh, maybe not give up too much, but something maybe up their alley. Uh, just uh, give me your thoughts. Let's talk about Caleb Smith. I actually kind of like Caleb Smith. I found Caleb Smith, I'm going to nerd out for a second, playing fantasy baseball and searching the waiver wire in my dynasty league and looking for a guy who had good peripheral stats that I might be able to snag in case he turned into something. And Caleb Smith had a great whip. And Caleb Smith had a really solid fielding independent pitching number that showed that Caleb Smith, even though he was on a bad team, was a good pitcher. And he was really in his first year of starting his third professional year of baseball, his first year of starting, because I think he was a relief pitcher basically for the Yankees, and then the Marlins acquired him. So Caleb goes out and pitches in 2018. He gets 16 starts. He's got a whip that's in the low 1.2s, and he's got a great fielding independent pitching number. He comes out the next year, though, and he gets more starts, and he had some, some scary things that happened. First off, he led the National League in home runs given up with 33. And his fielding independent pitching went from 3.96 to 5.11. But the whip did stay down. 1.24 in 2018, 1.22 in 2019. He also got the innings up from 77 to 153 as he continues to get himself into a starter's role. Going into his year 28 season, he has four more years of control. He is not even arbitration eligible until 2021. And his wins above replacement last year, a 1.8 which compared to some of the guys that are out there, pretty much the rest of the pool of pitching, if you're not getting Ryu, he's he's right up there at the top if you want to compare him. He's got a better wins above replacement than Keuchel had. So yeah, he's got control, he's got all those things, but are the Marlins going to give him up for nothing? No. He's slated to be their third starter, so you're going to have to give up something for him. And I don't want to give up Madrigal, and I don't want to give up Robert, and I don't want to give up Andrew Vaughn. I don't want to do that when you can go spend money and get a free agent without having to give up your prize prospects. That would make me aggravated, and I think a lot of White Sox fans would feel that way as well. Like, hey, it's hard to find guys like that. We should have been spending money instead of having to give away those top prospects to get a guy like Caleb Smith. That said, he's got a lot of control. If they like a couple of guys that are in our top 10 prospects that aren't those big three, and you want to give them up for him, I would completely understand that move. There's a long-term solution that you have pitching-wise. Sox always talk about they want control. There's a guy who's controllable. Sox want guys that have potential to get better. That's why they went after Zach Wheeler, who really hadn't proven as much as a Mad Bum or a Ryu. The Sox and other teams went after him. So here's a guy who's got that kind of potential. He's got some potential to actually be better than what he is. So I love the name. I love the pick. I don't know what you have to give up for him. I don't even know if the Marlins are interested in getting rid of him, but I love the call. That's a great one. Hey, this is Acoustic Mike from Broadcast Basement, and you're listening to Sox in the Basement with Chris and his buddy Dave. I did the broadcast basement with Chris for 10 years and nobody gave me a show. I'd leave if I had anything else to do with my life. Remember, the broadcast basement is available everywhere podcasts can be found and always at broadcastbasement.com. It's a busy week, I think, for everybody out there. It's a fun week, but it's also very busy. Some people let it get to them. You got Christmas next week. Most people are planning things, you know, parties. They got to get gifts. They're running all over the place. You have children. You even have a busier week coming up. If you're like me, in my family, our tradition, the big toys, they're already assembled and sitting there waiting there in the morning. So I'm not sitting around putting them together. So when they get that big gift, they walk down there and they just... They could just start playing with it at five o'clock in the morning when they wake up. The same kid that I can't wake up at eight o'clock in the morning for school, five o'clock in the morning, he's up Christmas morning, making a ton of noise. And I worry as a White Sox fan about what it must be like to be somebody that Rick Hahn, Kenny Williams, and the brain trust over at the White Sox buys for during the holidays. Because if they buy gifts, like they buy free agents. Christmas is miserable. There's a lot of disappointment. Let, let me just give you an example here. 
I had a kid at seven years old who wanted the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles sewer set. This was the hottest toy of that entire season. I remember I could not find this thing. Couldn't get it at Toys R Us. Couldn't find a thing online. You tried to order it. It was like, yeah, you'll get it. It'll be January 20th. Could not find this thing. Had to put out a thing across Facebook. Anybody that could find this all over the country, all my friends, people I've met living in different parts of the country. If you see this thing, please, I will pay for it. I will pay for shipping. I'll pay you for crying out loud. I just need this for this kid. It's all he wants on Christmas morning. And my cousin finds it in Brooklyn. She happens to be at a toy store in her neighborhood for something else. And they bring in a shipment of like 10 of them. And she buys the thing for me. God, I love her. Thank you. And then she ships it. It arrives like two days in advance of Christmas. I spend Christmas Eve until three in the morning putting this thing together. Half in the bag, probably full in the bag. We like to party in the Lanuti house, my parents' house, my dad, my mom, my sister and her family, me and my family. Everybody gets over, has a nice Christmas Eve, lots of pasta because we're Lanutis. Everybody eats, you know, opens up gifts between all of us. And then Christmas mornings for like everybody's individual family. I'm up all night putting this thing together. And I put it down underneath the tree. If I'm not mistaken, this is the exact same year my daughter wanted a Barbie dream house. Expensive gift. Now, she's nine. He's seven at the time. If I sit there and I say, wow, that $200 Barbie gift house is quite an investment of my time and my money. Is she really going to be playing with it four years from now? If I'm only going to get three years of worth out of it, is it really worth getting the Barbie dream house? The same thing with having to fight and beg and plead and come up with every possible option imaginable to find the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles sewer set and put the thing together. Do you think I was worried that my seven-year-old wouldn't be interested in it by the time he was 11? And trust me, he was done with the thing in maybe two years. It sits gathering dust in the back playroom of the kids. uh, They have a playroom in the basement behind the bar. It's the only other room down here in the basement besides a laundry room. If I would have thought that way, with the time and the money and the window that would have been there, they'd have gotten Tinker Toys. They would have been so disappointed Christmas morning. I'd have been sitting there saying, well, maybe next year. You don't always get everything you want from Santa Claus. You know, I had a seat at the table for the uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles toy. I just wasn't able to come through with it. This is what's going on right now with the White Sox and pitching. The fear of the extra year of commitment. The fear of outbidding. Yeah, of course, I know they outbid for Zach Wheeler, but they don't look like they're willing to get into any more bidding wars off of anybody else. It was Grandal, it was Wheeler, and after that, there was risk. There's a great article out by James Fegan in The Athletic. And James brings up a quote by Rick Hahn during the winter meetings. Here's the quote. You have to presume on older free agents that you're going to be dealing with some decline. In general, the investment on a position player is less risky than an investment in a pitcher. Those things vary. We're talking about very generic players. You generally err on the side of a position player being less risky. The White Sox are afraid to sign pitchers long-term after a certain age. They looked at Zach Wheeler. They looked at the year and a half that he didn't even pitch. They see his arm, even after Tommy John surgery, as not being as worn down as the other arms on the market. And they were willing to spend $120 million in five years for Zach Wheeler, but they are not willing to give four years to Ryu. They are not willing to give five years, and we're not willing to give five years to Madison Bumgarner. And Dallas Keuchel eventually is going to get four years. And I don't know if they're going to be willing to give that either. This team is afraid to go out and spend money and years because of what happens on the back end with pitchers. There's an absolute fear. In the, in the Rick Hahn household, in the Kenny Williams household, the kids come down the stairs and the dream house is not there. The toy they wanted is not there. There's replacement toys. There's a knockoff toy. Because the belief is that the kid is not going to be interested in it. The toy will not have its worth later on. That, if, if you put it in those terms, that's where we're at right now as Sox fans. I'm very happy with the Grandal move. I have no problem with the Mazara move. I said that last week. 
I am very, very concerned that this team is not willing to pay for the pitchers that remain on the market. They just are afraid. They want, they for some reason believe that the that they're going to be able to go out there. The White Sox are going to be able to go out there and outbid teams to find those rare pitchers that are still available in their late 20s, but not their early 30s, that they could sign a controllable con- contracts, but not have to pay for any bad years, and that they don't need to take a risk on a pitcher. And it's ludicrous. Look, some pitchers pitch great well into their 30s. Look at Zach Reinke. Look, there are players out there to do it. Your job as an organization is to identify those players and decide which one carries the least amount of risk. I get it. You found Bumgarner to have too much risk. Great. But there had to be a guy out there. There had to be somebody other than Wheeler that had to be your second choice. And now I'm feeling that there isn't. And the big rumor is, and this this rumor now has been told to me by multiple beat writers, that the White Sox are focused in on David Price being acquired in a deal with the Boston Red Sox. And there's a reason that it hasn't happened yet. And the reason's money and the reason's risk. David Price in the last three years has pitched 74 innings, 176 innings, and 107 innings. And he's getting paid $33 million a year. And if you go and acquire David Price, you're getting his year 34, year 35, and year 36 seasons. They're afraid to pay Madison Bumgarner into those years. Or they would have gone and made a better deal and an offer that was good enough that even though he preferred Arizona, he would have considered. They don't want to pay him that late. Fine, I understand it. This team has a price tag. They have a threshold. Depending on how old you are as a pitcher, we will only pay this much. We will only give this many years. And they're working in within these constraints And guess what? The market is not in those constraints. The Sox want everything to go exactly the way that they want it to go. And they don't have any urgency. And Dave and I talked about that a couple of months ago. And and again, I'm sorry, you don't hear Dave on the show because Dave came down with like the flu. Like he is sick as a dog. And he's like, do you want me to come over to the house? I'm like, we are five days before everything starts happening. Four days before parties and Christmas. I have three kids. I got a four-year-old walking around here. He gets within 20 feet of you. This house will be infected through New Year's. I love you, buddy. And he's like, that's why I called. Dave and I talked about this in August when people were talking about Lewis Robert and whether or not the White Sox should bring Lewis Robert up in August. Our contention was the moment the trade deadline ended, with the year he was having, he should have been elevated to the major leagues. Our contention was... By the White Sox never bringing Lewis Robert up, they're now playing games with service time. By the White Sox never considering bringing Nick Mandrigal up, they are playing games with service time. You cannot be competing for the postseason when you are not going to start the season with two pieces that you consider to be upgrades and long-term solutions in center field, second base, and your lineup as a whole. They have Michael Kopech not going to be, he's not going to be up here until they can manipulate him a little bit too. They want to save that year that they lost with him injured. Carlos Rodon's not back until the back half of the year. They, they don't want to pay for bad back end years because they don't intend to or don't believe their window is open in 2020. And it's maddening, I think, to White Sox fans. See the Indians trade away Corey Kluber. You're, you're right in there with the Twins fighting for some of the same names on the pitching market. But I don't think your team sees 2020 as the beginning of their window, which is extremely frustrating when you think about the guys that are going to be the first ones that are going to come available in free agency in just a few years in Moncada and Giolito. How big is the window going to be? Is it 10 years of suffering with a three or four year rebuild for a two year window? Is that good enough for White Sox fans? I mean, you could make the argument, well, yeah, we want to keep things controllable so we can pay Moncada down the line. We can pay Giolito down the line. But guess what? Sox fans don't believe that you're going to do it because of the way that you have conducted business for decades. There is a there's an absolute fear that you'll be able to hold on to those players when they get those massive offers that we're seeing now over the last couple of years. I mean, guys are making $300 million over 10 years now as a norm. The first top three, four, five guys in free agency are looking at massive deals. And you, you have two guys, at least maybe three, 
that over the next three or four years could be those kind of guys and you want to retain them. So how big is your window? And that's where the frustration comes in. I don't know if David Price is somebody they're going to go get. In the White Sox world, and you got to remember, they're trying to, they have their mindset. They're like, this is what we want. They're very tunnel vision, this team. We want Grandel, we want Wheeler. Thank God they got Grandel. Imagine if they don't get Grandel or Wheeler with this offseason is sounding like. What this thing is looking like. Oh, he's just shuddering. They at least got one of them. But then once it was over, it was like, okay, well, we didn't get what we wanted. And these other guys are asking for years that we don't want to give and money that we don't want to give. But the thing is, is that even though you think a guy is worth X doesn't mean that he's really worth Y. It's basic economics 101. It's supply and demand. This entire time, there have been more teams interested in the first two levels of starting pitchers in free agency than there were pitchers in those levels. There was going to be a team or two left without a chair. And the White Sox are looking more and more like the team is going to be left without a chair. If you don't want to be left without a chair, you're going to have to overpay a little bit. You're going to have to give a year that you don't want to have to give. Otherwise, you better be ready for Sox Fest when you're going to sit there and try to tell everybody that the window hasn't opened yet. I, I look forward to the, the t-shirts made by Sox fans with, with closed windows. Signs on them that say, do not open until 2021. Signed, Rick. You can't go out. I mean, this is just like the Machado thing all over again. You can't go out and say, we're going to go get two starting pitchers and some left-handed hitting and fix the DH in the right field spot. And, you know, like, and and the problem is you're looking at free agency. Some people are like, whoa, 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 it's only mid-December. And we said the same thing, but man, look how quick guys are going. Look how quick guys are going. It's a nerve wracking thing, I think, for White Sox fans. I'm nervous about the pitching thing. I like the Grandal move, and I have nothing against the Mazzara move. I'm very, very scared about the pitching thing. It's become a very frightening thing to me. This feels like a team that gets burned, and the only analogy that I can give you is like in fantasy football. You know, fantasy baseball, as much as I love playing fantasy baseball, I don't know if I can give an analogy for fantasy baseball that it would work as well, but most of the world plays fantasy football. A couple years back, if you had Rob Gronkowski on your team, you were a playoff team in fantasy football. You had to really screw it up not to get in there. He would just, he, if you had to have a tight end and it wasn't a flex tight end or something like that, but you had to have a tight end. He was so heads and tails above all other tight ends that he gave you such an advantage in head-to-head games that you were going to the postseason unless you really screwed it up. And I, in a dynasty fantasy football league, made a trade to acquire Rob Gronkowski. I invested in him. And the very next year he got hurt. He never really did a full 16-game slate again. Travis Kelsey caught up, and I looked foolish. And it hurt my fantasy football team so badly that I won't draft a tight end anywhere near the front of a draft ever again. I will never value a tight end like that ever again. It scares me to death. It set back my fantasy football franchise that I pay $80 a year to be in so much that I won't do it again. The White Sox are me on a massive level when it comes to starting pitching. This absolute fear. Well, you know, Ryu's 33 and he wants four years. Do we really want to pay a guy till he's 37 years old? Bumgarner's 30, but look at all those innings. Do we really want to pay him through the age of 35? I feel like that they sit down and there's an excuse made every time it's time to pull the trigger. That they're gun shy. That they, they know they need to get the pitcher, but they're waiting for that perfect opportunity. And it's not like somebody's going to come walking out into the middle of the market that they can go and grab. This David Price thing, the only reason that they're interested in David Price right now is because David Price, they think they can get on the cheap. I guarantee you the only hang up, and from what I hear, talking to a lot of people who are at least in the know a little bit, who talk to people within the organization, this is about money. Red Sox aren't looking for massive prospects. I don't think they're looking for Andrew Vaughn, Nick Madrigal, or Lewis Robert. They're crazy for that. They're trying to salary dump. And the White Sox want them to take more salary than they want to give up right now. And why should they do it right now? The Angels still need pitching. The Twins still want pitching. Those two teams along with the White Sox. Other teams are still trying to get pitching. The Dodgers are still looking to try to get Ryu back. Teams still want that high-quality pitching. And I guarantee you the Red Sox are going to sit back and wait until one of the other teams that also misses out is gone. 
And then they won't have to give up as much money to the White Sox because a bidding war will erupt between the White Sox and another team. And you know who's not going to win that? Us. Because we're gun shy. Because it'll be justified in the end that, oh, well, I don't want to pay this guy because there's going to be some bad years on the back. Because guess what? David Price is not going to come in and be high-level David Price for you for those three years. He just hasn't demonstrated that's what he's going to be. Is he a veteran presence? Yes. Can he provide you some quality innings? Yes. But in the three remaining years that you're going to get David Price, you'd be lucky to get two quality ones, and you're most likely getting one and a half. And it seems like that's what they're zeroing in on right now. I, I love the fact that they're under the they're under the radar, but I don't know how much of it is under the radar and how much of it is they're gun shy and they're also rands because they're afraid to spend the money. I am very, very afraid that the thing that will be told to all of us is, well, we didn't have Robert and Madrigal ready to go at the beginning of the year. Michael Kopech is coming back. Carlos Rodon is coming back. We didn't want to pay for back end, and the window wasn't open to start 2020. The real window's 2021. And if you do that, you've now pushed back the window further than what you said at the beginning of this thing and all throughout. And you've let down your fan base for the second straight season, declaring what it was that you were going to target a free agency and not coming through. Socks in the basement. Socks in the basement. Socks in the basement. Socks in the basement. Heard everywhere podcasts can be found and always on socksinthebasement.com.